Hi everyone, Chris Potts here. This screencast just walks through our final exam, just as I did for the midterm. As before, I'll read the questions and offer some notes and suggestions that should help put your mind at ease as you work. In addition, I've created a handout that provides model answers for the questions that are on the final to give you examples of what we're expecting in terms of length and technical detail and so forth. To start, I've just put some reminders here at the top. These are pretty much carried over from the midterm. The exam is due on March 16 by 11.30 a.m. Pacific. That's the very end of our scheduled exam period. Now, we won't make any use of the scheduled exam period, but that seems like a fair deadline. And I'm confident that you could complete the entire exam during our allotted period if you needed to. No late work will be accepted. And this is very strict in this instance because we have almost no time to get all of our final grading done and file our final grades for the quarter. As before, you submit on Canvas. That's just a file upload. Uh, as before, no collaboration of any kind is permitted. You're free to use your notes and any other reference materials you like, but you can't discuss the material at all with each other. If you have questions, please submit them on the ed form or via the email address to the staff. Please don't write to individual teaching team members about the exam. Use that staff address. Uh, we as a team need to stay on the same page in terms of what kinds of hints and tips we're sharing. But in any case, our default mode is going to be to try to discuss instead the model answers that I wrote up rather than talking about the exam questions themselves. And whatever distance there is between my model questions and answers and the exam is precisely what we're aiming to evaluate you on in terms of creatively applying the ideas from the course. So mostly we're going to want to stay silent about that. All right, let's dive into these questions. Question one, quantifiers, entailments, and implicatures worth two points. And it says, a classic Gricean argument is that most is semantically consistent with every, but tends to exclude it pragmatically because of a quality-quantity interaction. This argument depends on the semantic claim that every entails most. Your task is to support this semantic claim, assuming the following meanings. Now, I should emphasize that this is all you have to do, support this claim about entailment. I motivated this question using Gricean implicatures, but you're just asked to prove this foundational assumption about entailment as a kind of stepping stone in a maybe future Gricean argument that you might want to give. The determiner meanings I've given in M and E are the ones we've been using for these determiners throughout the quarter. And I've specified that in this context, a determiner meaning D1 entails another determiner meaning D2 if and only if the following holds. If D1 A of B is true, then D2 A of B is true for all sets A and B. And this final note is absolutely crucial. Assume throughout that the first argument to the determiner is non-empty. The proof just won't go through without this assumption, so don't overlook it, and it's a bad sign if you never need to invoke this assumption. I should emphasize that what we're looking for here is a formal argument using abstract sets. So please don't use English sentences or English intuitions alone. Those might be useful, but they just can't carry this argument. For a model answer, check out the argument I give on the model answers handout for few and no. The whole proof here is one sentence, and yours can probably be just as simple and succinct, though you'll need to restrict, as I said, to the case where the first argument is non-empty, whereas the few and no case doesn't require that as I've defined them. Okay, question two, presuppositional quantificational determiner worth two points. Keenan defines a quantified presupposition free version of the as follows. And this meaning is classic Keenan where he has packed the presuppositional component into the at issue meaning as a first conjunct. Your task is to convert this to a presuppositional quantificational determiner on the model of our presuppositional treatment of neither and both. Now, two things. First, yes, this is very simple. If you understand the meanings of neither and both that we defined as partial functions, then this question will be very easy for you. There are no tricks. It may indeed be simple. Second, make sure that you define this as a quantificational determiner meaning. If you copy over our version of the, that's a function from sets to entities, you're not going to get any credit. So make sure what you offer is like both and neither in terms of the semantic type. 
for a model answer here. I just copied over neither from our presupposition handout to emphasize that we really are just looking for a technical specification of the meaning. On to question three, every in presuppositionality, worth two points. On assignment five, you gave a Gricean explanation for why it's generally odd for a speaker to say every AB if they know that A is not true of any entities. An alternative analysis would be that every actually presupposes that A is true of at least one entity. Okay, that's the background. Read it carefully. Here you have two tasks. Task one, formulate this presuppositional every as a partial quantificational determiner meaning. So this will look like neither in its overall form, but of course the content of the definedness condition and the ad issue content will be different. Task two, this is the new piece. Articulate what this analysis predicts about the monotonicity properties of every and explain why it makes these predictions using a technical argument. For examples of technical arguments of this form, see the handout some formal analyses of determiners. The relevant arguments there are the ones that diagnose monotonicity properties of determiners, which is something that you've done all throughout the quarter, essentially. Here's the new piece. Given the presuppositions involved here, it's worth being explicit that all of the monotonicity definitions require preservation of truth, and flipping from true to undefined is not preservation of truth. Now, this question is somewhat unique, but I did do a related one where I just show that neither is not downward monotone, even though its at issue content is just like that of determiner no, which we know to be downward monotone. Okay, question four, what kind of meaning is this? Worth two points. This question has exactly the same structure as question one from assignment seven. The idea is to use our flow chart for diagnosing meanings to figure out for yourself what confirm does with regard to the target meaning that I've specified. In more detail, the handout diagnosing different kinds of meanings provides a flow chart for classifying meanings as variously at issue, conventionally implicated, presupposed, or conversationally implicated. Use that framework to classify meaning P as expressed in C. And sentence C is, Sam confirmed that Carol ran the marathon, and the target meaning is that Carol ran the marathon. As usual with these questions, we're not evaluating your judgments. This is a tricky case, and people might in general differ in their intuitions about such cases. So our evaluation is entirely about how you reason in terms of the tests and the flowchart. I didn't include a model answer to this on my model answers handout, because there's a whole page of such model answers on the diagnosing different kinds of meaning flowchart uh, handout, and those examples cover every scenario you can face given our framework. So I'd suggest that you adopt the same format as I used, and we're looking for a similar level of explanation about the relevant examples, which is just to say that you don't need to write very much here. Just try to specify unambiguously how you're reasoning using the flowchart. Question five, scalar adjective experimental predictions worth two points. The adjective empty can be modified by maximal standard adverbs like completely, as in completely empty. In light of this, on the theory developed by Surrett et al. 2009, what is the expected pattern of behavior for children and adults for the prompt, hand me the empty one, in an experimental condition in which the subject is presented with two boxes, both partly full of toys, but one noticeably fuller than the other? And why is this the expected behavior on their theory? I think this is straightforward. Let me just highlight a few things. First, the first sentence of the question is telling you what you need to know about the scale structure given the adverb adjective modification framework that we discussed in class. That classification lets you connect with Sered et al's theory and in turn with their experimental predictions. Second, this is about what they would expect, not what they found. You don't need to relate this to what they did observe or what we observed in our experiment for adjectives that can be modified by completely and the like. For a model answer, I did essentially this question for an adjective that can't be modified by maximal or minimal standard adjectives. And you can see my answer is just three sentences. Should be super simple if you understand Surrett et al's theory. Okay, penultimate question. Illocutionary effects worth two points. In Speaking of Crime, Solon and Tiersma observe that people in police custody often perform the speech act of invoking their right to counsel very indirectly, with utterances like, maybe I need a lawyer. Your task, 
Using the properties of illocutionary force given in section 4.2 of the Speech Acts handout, give two reasons why people in custody might behave this way. That is, why are they being so indirect? There are a number of sensible reasons that connect with the illocutionary force properties that I've given on the handout. You can just pick two. Uh, we expect each reason to take three to five sentences to describe. Now, I couldn't really think of a direct analog of this question for my model answer, so I did one that's in the same space. Mine addresses illocutionary intentions and perceptions about those intentions in the Bustamante Fourth Amendment case that we talked about in class. My answer is longer than yours is required to be, and indeed, you might not need to write this much, but I couldn't help myself. The issues are complex and also very important and weighty, so it took me some time to get this to my satisfaction. Final question. This is meant to be a fun one. Swearing and the FCC were three points. Provide three cogent linguistic or cognitive arguments in favor of the position that swears like the F word should be subject to different legal restrictions than other kinds of speech. Two to four sentences per argument. The arguments might not be persuasive to you, but they should make sense. They should be cogent. Now, I'll provide lots of arguments in this space in our final class meeting, so you'll have your pick. I didn't do a model answer here because I didn't want to use up any arguments, but I also think that you'll find this question easy if you attend to the class material or watch the relevant screencasts. I'm mainly hoping that this question is rewarding for you to reflect on. I want to emphasize that you don't have to agree with the arguments. I myself think it's actually more rewarding to articulate arguments I don't believe in to see how persuasive I can make them sound, but if that's not to your taste, maybe you can find some that you can get behind. Just please, please, please don't say that it's persuasive that swears like the F word should be subject to different legal restrictions in order to protect the children. Protecting the children alone is not a cogent argument. There are cogent arguments in there concerning kids and language learning and acculturation, but protecting them from hearing taboo words just isn't such an argument. Thank you.